Good evening, everyone. It really is a tremendous honor this evening to open with an inaugural lecture to start the Marymount Lecture Series from uh, Ms. Alessandra Necci. The conception of this series is to provide the Marymount community with an opportunity to come together to discuss ideas that are important in the world. Ideas that are not going to be examined through um, a essay or an assignment or a project. Ideas that are meaningful in the moment that we discuss them and that have been meaningful over thousands of years will continue to be meaningful for many thousands more. Last year, in the many hundreds of people I met coming to Marymount Rome, Ms. Necci stood out uh, to me in my first conversation with her. We met to discuss uh, a very particular matter, and we ended up in a half an hour covering philosophy and politics, ideas, uh, power structures, and art in the world that we are part of. Her career is as extensive as it is deep. She began with a study of classics and law, both in Rome and in Paris. She's worked as a journalist, as a political advisor, as a voice for women, as a voice for contemporary politics. The range and the depth of her experience is quite staggering. And when we mark that she is also an author of some wonderful historical biography, she's an example for us of what she speaks of. The Renaissance woman with a commitment and a passion for learning. And it is our great privilege this evening that she is going to take some time to share that passion with us. I invite you to welcome with me Ms. Alessandra Necci. Dear Mrs. Gallagher, Mrs. Mingazzini, Mrs. Cameron, teacher, parents, and the entire Marymount community, it is for me a great honor and a great pleasure to inaugurate this series of lectures initiated by the Marymount School of Rome that have this very important object of instilling a lifelong love of learning. You know, love for learning and knowledge in general is not just a scholastic question and doesn't just have the goal, very important but limited in time, of learning as much as possible to get good results in the exam. Passion for learning, passion for culture, passion for knowledge go beyond this and they never, never expire. It is a fundamental concept in any phase of our life and at any level. In a way, we can, we can obviously say that knowledge is a container in which we can find everything, really everything, learning too. You know that the Italian word conoscenza, knowledge, comes from Latin, cognoscere, which means to know. And the Italian word apprendimento, learning, comes always from Latin, but it is ad prendere, so it means coming to know something. There is an active, it's an active verb, that's very interesting. So, knowledge and learning respond to a very basic necessity of the human beings. Without them, it's very difficult to understand who we are, where are we going, and if you want something more concretely, to buy something solid in life. You know that uh, maybe some of you remember that in the ancient Greece, uh, 
in the famous Delphi temple, it was carpet gnoti se auton, it is a Greek sentence, which means know yourself. This is very important because true knowledge and learning start from ourselves and then we move outside. We start inside and then we move outside. Obviously, this is an extremely vast topic and it is being covered by a lot of experts, a lot of fields, endless fields of application. Internal and external, immanent and transcendental are the two sides of the same medal. I should say that there are, they are communicating vessels and they can't exist separately. They are fundamental to make each one of us a complete individual. Maybe some of you remember that Ulysses in the Divine Comedy of Dante Alighieri says, fatti non foste a viver come bruti, ma per cercar virtute e conoscenza, which in English is, you were not born to live as brutes, but to follow virtue and knowledge. So you see the two aspects, virtue on one side, knowledge and learning on the other side. Sometimes I know this reflection could be what could seem outdated because we are in the information technology, everything moves very fast. Well, it's not true at all. It's not true at all. We are crossed a new and difficult phase, unexpected. A very famous uh, philosopher, philosopher called Zygmunt Bauman, which passed away recently, told, uh, sp spoke about uh, the liquid economy. Maybe, up to me, we are in a gaseous economy and gaseous society because it's something that you can't touch, you can't take. So everything moves very, very fast. And I mean, we are aware, obviously, of the positivity of information technology, but we must remember, we don't have to underestimate the dangers. This is true most of all uh, for the young, obviously. And I should say the importance of, of history is more and more real, strong in this particular part of life, this particular phase. It is needed to understand the present in which we live and to shape the future. Knowledge of history is not an image to preserve just for a romantic nostalgia of the past. It is not a beautiful picture, black and white. It is something completely different. On the contrary, it is one of the most important maps to decipher the world that surrounds us. A famous ph Italian philosopher called Benedetto Croce uh, said that history is always contemporary. Another one called uh, Giovanni Battista Vico spoke of corsi and ricorsi, occurrence and recurrences, flux and reflux of history. I think it's true. In my opinion, history has a real meaning, especially if it is a real key to understand the present. That's what I, I try to do with my books, because in general, I start with a key event and a key historical figure. I do like to write about life, about history of men and women. Honestly, I do not have a mechanistic vision of history, but I neither believe that history is just a series of causes and effects. I do like very much to understand the soul, the mind of the protagonist of history, their lives obviously, and psychology. You know that biography comes from Greek, Bi bios is life, so it's speaking about life of some different persons. I always start from inside and then I move toward the outside. With this introduction, you can understand that I can't agree with those who believe that history is superfluous. 
I think that history is, first of all, master of life. The Latin, Latin said, history is a great master of life. And it's a one important map to understand the present and to build the future. Uh, today, you know, we are, we are referring in particular to the Renaissance. Mm, I do think that Renaissance is very important, not, not just because it's very beautiful, charming, etc., but because you really can understand the present, you can understand Italy today, studying the Italian Renaissance. That's why it's very important. As you know, everybody knows that the Renaissance comes immediately after the Middle Ages. The Middle Ages has suffered a very bad and sad reputation coming from after the, the, the Rome, etc., etc. It means Middle Ages, so age in between the ancient age and the modern age. But honestly, it's not exactly like this. Middle Ages is a so, without any doubt, difficult phase, long phase, but much more interesting than somebody can think. You know that the Middle Ages start after the fall of the Roman Empire in 476, and we land about a thousand years later with the discovery of America. The Middle Ages, I just want to spend two seconds, two minutes about Middle Ages because it's important to, to, understand, uh, to understand the Renaissance. Middle Ages is uh, traditionally divided into two periods. The first one is the High Middle Ages. It's a difficult and obscure space. Uh, Europe uh, gets poorer, there is a real depopulation of cities and a regression. The only point of reference uh, everybody knows is the Church of Rome. But there is one thing, very interesting and very positive. The monasteries are the real point of reference for civilization, culture, and prayer, obviously. You know, you know the, the famous amanuensi who write down, who copied the ancient text of the classical authors, Latin and Greek. So they conserve the ancient text, rewrite the text, and do something for the future, for the world to be. In model, I want to, to underline one thing. Not all the Middle Ages are the same. For example, you know that Charlemagne was named emperor of the Holy Roman Empire on Christmas 800. And Charlemagne reunites the territories, uh, uh, rebuilds the domain, uh, relaunches the cultural life. Uh, maybe you don't know that Charlemagne, theoretically, is the one who is considered the inventor of the school. Or, well, we can say that uh, he do it again. He made a nice and different idea of school and learning. Anyhow, after his death, the feudalism uh, start to getting stronger and stronger. The feudalism system is peculiar because it's a, a hierarchical system based on a pyramidal structure and the life of people revolves around the castle of the Lord. Anyhow, after this difficult period, Europe knows a recovery and the condition of life improves, the political stability returns. But the, the things I want to underline is that a new class is born. It is the bourgeoisie, the middle class. The word bourgeoisie comes from Bourg, so small town. And you know very well that it, it will be the most important class in the future. So it is start during the Middle Age. We have to remember that. The, the, the bourgeoisie, the middle class, uh, practice uh, trade and commerce uh, or liberal activities. So not the nobles, not the people. That's very important to know. In Italy, we have a particular and peculiar form of political life, which are the comuni. With Mrs. Cameron, we look for a good translation which could be city-states or municipality, if you want. In any case, they are 
th there is nothing uh, similar in Europe because in that period, in Europe, we start to know the first part of national state. In Italy, on the contrary, there are a lot of particularism. And that's why we have the Comuni. Well, the Comuni had a very brief democratic season, a very brief democratic period with a real autonomy of government. But the, the, this experiment will fall, will, sorry, will fail, and there will be a deep crisis. The Comuni will become the famous Signorie, which means more or less a lordship. Il Signore is an important lord, always a, an evolution of feudalism. And then in 14th century, Middle Age reaches his end. In any case, I want to underline one very important thing. In the 14th century in Italy, we have three extraordinary poems and intellectuals, which are Dante Alighieri, Francesco Petrarca, and Giovanni Boccaccio. They refer to the value of the ancient Rome, so the classical period. They recall to the classicism as a way of life, and they wish the reunification of Italy. You must remember that Italy was completely divided. And furthermore, the Petrarca and Boccaccio are really the predecessor of the humanists. And they will be a great inspiration for the, the humanism movement. Another thing I want to underline, in the Middle Ages, the most important and classical pieces are preserved and transmitted. And that's something building for the future generation. In the Middle Ages, so in, in a period, in a long phase, which is considered very dark, not always everything is dark or light, and we have to see deeper. Then, after this uh, huge but necessary introduction, we can really enter in the heart of the subject. As you know, there is humanism in 15th century and Renaissance in 61. Humanism as birth as born in Italy. I told you Italy, unfortunately, after the, the fall of the Roman Empire, was a completely divide, a divided country, completely. So you must think about the, the map. In the northern part of Italy, there were the so-called signorie, which very important uh, cities like Milan, which was the richest one, the richest one ruled by the Sforza, and there were other wonderful signorie, like for example Ferrara, ruled by Este, Mantova, ruled by Gonzaga, and others, plenty of them. Always in the northern part, but here, there was a feudalist state, which was the Piemonte, ruled by Savoia. It is very strange, but in the future, the Savoia will have a huge relevance in the unification, but long time. And then there, there is, in the other part, there is Venice, the Republic of Venice, the powerful Serenissima, who rule on a part of the Adriatic Sea and a lot of, a lot of, a lot of town. So that's the situation in the northern part. Then we can move a bit well, down, going down to the, to the center, you know that we have Tuscany. In Tuscany, Tuscany has something really peculiar. It is Firenze, the Republic of Firenze, ruled by the famous bankers family of Medici. The most important, but we, we will go back to him, uh, man of that period was Lorenzo de' Medici, called the Magnificent, which was uh, an extraordinary political man and extraordinary patron. So Florence was really the center of all. Even if, uh, even if Florence was a republic, it was not a signoria, because the Medici family preferred to stay behind the scene, not to be exactly the first, the, on the first row. And then we arrive, obviously, to Rome and all the papal state. It was a huge reign, 
always and more or less the feudalist, with Rome, but not just Rome, because there was the part of Umbria, a part again of the Marche, and even going to the north part, Romagna and Emilia. The, unfortunately, very often the popes support too much the relative, and so they give in birth to the famous and notorious nepotism, nepotism, and in addition, they practice sometimes the sale of indulgence. You know what it is, it is selling forgiveness of sins for money. And so, these mothers added to other are, will be the main reason for the schism of Martin Luther. There is another aspect I want to underline, very important. Some historians, among which there is Niccolò Machiavelli, are convinced that the presence of the papacy in the center of Italy is one of the main obstacles to the unification. I'm not saying that is completely true, but in any case, it is true that a very strong papacy in the center of Italy is an obstacle to a confederation or unification because it was a real power, not just a spiritual power. We have to understand this. And this is something we will see when we talk about Martin Lutero. And then in the south of the peninsula, there is a huge feudal state, which it is ruled by the Spanish Aragons, the Aragonese, and it, it is called the Regno di Napoli e Sicilia. It has a very lively cultural life, but unfortunately not so developed from a political and economical point of view. I want you to understand very well the political Italian situation with division and troubles. First of all, because it's very important to understand the Renaissance, but last but not least, because you can understand some of complex particularism contemporary. You can understand our Italy today looking at the Renaissance. Another thing, furthermore, the Italian peninsula, you know, is located in the center of the Mediterranean Sea. And so in that period, uh, before the geographic discovery, it was the center of trade and commerce. It was the center of our, so at, the, at that age, obviously, the then known world. This is very important because Italy was a key to enter in the system. So, we arrive to the humanism. The 15th century obviously bring great change. Everything starts from the culture. We go back, Mrs. Gallagher, to the knowledge, learning, it, apprentice, and so on. Everything starts from the culture. In the Middle Age, culture was tied to the religion. You know that the only aim of life was deserving heaven. And so it was a theocentric vision. God was the center of everything. Now the scene changed. Everything changed. The man, I call him anthro anthropocentric vision, is the center of the universe. A very famous ancient Greek philosopher called Protagora says that the human being is measure of all things. This is a very famous slogan. And the humanism has completely developed this interesting concept. Not by chance, the very first part of the period, humanism, comes from the expression studia humanitas, a Latin expression which means human, humanity studies, obviously, but also interest for the human being. And so, uh, as I told you, it's a cultural movement, but it's based on the revival of Greek and Roman classical text. That's, we have to thank the humanism, have to thank uh, all the monks, uh, the monasteries, uh, Petrarca. You see that the history is always something continual. There are not such a strong interruption we, sometimes we can think. 
Another thing, um, I told you that humanism is built on the, uh, anthropocentrism, so the mankind is the center of the universe, and beauty in all forms, but related to the classical rules, is the term of comparison for everybody. Even if the humanism philosophy is related close to our life on the heart, it is something which not deny at all religion. One of the great capacity of humanism is put together the element before Christ, so the pre-Christian, we should say the pagan elements, and the Christian one. It's a happy synthesis of everything with no other comparison in history. Obviously, the revaluation of the human being bring to new studies. There is uh, Niccolò Copernico, in, uh, it will be in the 16th century, who will discover that heart revolves around the sun. You know very well that one. But, I mean, it's interesting because the, the um, humanism is in the life. The humanists are involved in political life of their city and even in the pedagogic systems. So school and university are developing. Library and museums are embellished. The, the central role for humanism, I want to underline it, it, has, it is art. Art is very, very important. You must consider that in the past, the painters and sculptors were, were compared to artisans, so we, they were not, not very considerate. Now everything changed. Artists are beauty maker, and that's why they get so important. Obviously, on the other side of the coin, there is a strong coming back of patronage, the famous mecenati. So, lords, popes, uh, uh, kings, uh, Lorenzo the Magnificent, uh, they sponsored the most important artists of the period. They commissioned them new palaces, uh, masterpieces. They paid them, they sustained them in the court. This is very Italian. Everybody wants to have the most beautiful palace of all, the most beautiful town of all. And uh, this is a positive aspect of this uh, typical individualism, because now, today, Italy is the open-air museum that we know thanks to that period, because it was a challenge. Everybody will say, okay, my town is, more. if you go to see Urbino, or Mantova, or Siena, so I'm talking about small city, they are wonderful, something unbelievable. Everybody wanted to be the best. And we must be clear, arte is what in Latin, in Latin we say instrumentum regni. It's a good way to rule, to have power, to show the power. Because if you have the most beautiful palace or masterpieces, you are a powerful man. So it's obvious that art gains and political and social function, and it shows the power, the wealthy of the Italian signori. Uh, another thing I want to mention are the Italian courts. The corti italiane are wonderful with a lot of elegant ladies and gentlemen. And one of the most famous books of that period is called Il Cortegiano, which is Il Cortigiano, obviously the courtesan. From, uh, it is written by Baldassarre Castiglione, and it is dedicated to the Duchess of Urbino, which was one of the most beautiful court of that period. Another important thing, City planning, urbanism, they, archi sorry, architecture, they have a very relevant role. The cities change their face. They are modernized. <coughs> I want to mention one city in particular. I don't know if somebody of you has visited Ferrara, which is a wonderful city of the northern part of Italy, ruled, as I told, uh, by the Este family, 
and Ferrara was the most modern Italian, not just Italian, but European city in that period because the Duke Ercole d'Este has decided to do the famous Addizione Herculea, so embellish, modernize completely the town. And it's incredible because it's just a small town. It's not Rome or Paris or London. It's just a small town, but Ferrara was the most important. Another branch I want to underline is the book production. You know that Gutenberg has invented the printing press and then Aldo Manuzio, which, which come from Penis, was the, the, the printer and the editor who makes Venice the most important book production center in that period. That's incredible. And my, my, my editor comes from Venice, and that's why I know a lot of about Manuzio, because he's completely obsessed by this Aldo Manuzio. And so in my last book, I dedicate one chapter just talking about him. But there is something more. Another branch that grows is political thought. I know that Niccolò Machiavelli and Francesco Guicciardini, uh, most of all, Niccolò Machiavelli has uh, a reputation which sometimes is a bit dark, a bit sad. But we have, remember that we have to distinguish. Be Ma Niccolò Machiavelli is one thing, is the author of the famous book Il Principe. The Machiavellism is completely another thing. They are completely different. The Machiavelli, I want just to spend two words because it's very important to, to understand. Niccolò Machiavelli has a pessimistic vision, without any doubt, but cynical maybe, but very exact. It is not true at all that he says that the end justifies the means. This is not true. Machiavelli said, political life has nothing to share, nothing to see, with virtue, with moral, different things. For a prince need to be uh, even cruel sometimes he, if he wants to reign and keep the power. That's the key. But the, the, Italian, the Italian situation justifies uh, Machiavelli analysis. And um, Francesco Guicciardini, which I want, who I want to mention, was the, the writer who, for the first time, spoke about the Italian particularism. He called them particulari, saying that in Italy there is not a global project, so every particular win on an idea, a global idea, a global project. And I must say that in this, uh, I mean, way of thinking, we can find a lot of uh, Italy vices and virtues, maybe. Well, so um, I, I want to, to underline that during humanism and Renaissance, there is a blossom of all human thinking branches. No comparison in history. Maybe, maybe the period of Pericles in ancient Greek and, and Augustus in Rome. We have such a genius like Leonardo da Vinci or Pico della Mirandola, which is a bit less known, but who knows an incredible number of languages. And there are a lot of painters. Uh, I just named somebody, but you know, like me, Raffaello or Michelangelo or Piero della Francesca, Tiziano, and there are fantastic writers like Ludovico Ariosto, Ercole Strozzi, Pietro Bembo, and a lot of them. I, don't, I can't name all because they are too much. And uh, that's a very, I want to add something, and now we arrive to the other point, which are women. Well, in the Italian Renaissance, we have a lot of remarkable men and a lot of remarkable women too. But, obviously, the situation is very different. Nobody, a woman can't affirm herself just for her own merit. The only way to affirm herself is a good marriage or in some, some cases, the, the, the courtesan profession, but this is obviously not a merit. Women like Artemisia Gentileschi, who was an artist, are really an exception. 
Female condition during the Renaissance is a bit better than during Middle Ages, but just for the upper class. Nothing to add. I mean, the princess, the dams, the damsel, damsel who live in the court are obviously elegant, uh, uh, trained, uh, gifted, cultivated, well behaved. I don't have to add anything. But, well, they are the top. So, I mean, uh, they can reach high position if they made a good marriage. And I want to underline this, it is a common practice that, for example, the wives hold the regency when their husband are abroad, or there is a war, or the children are underage, etc., etc. So for the women it's possible to reach power and authority, but just, just, if they are born at a very high level. Obviously, equality, equality between men and women, uh, unfortunately, does not exist, uh, and it will not exist for a very long period. Between the most important princess, uh, I want to name, first of all, Isabella d'Este. Isabella d'Este is the daughter of the Duke of the Ferrara and the wife of the Marquis of Mantova. She was born in the second part of 15th century, and since uh, the, the first part of her, her childhood, uh, everybody was astonished because she was so intelligent, so talented, so gifted. Everybody was impressed. And when she arrived, she was just uh, 16 years old uh, when she arrived uh, and she, she married the Marquis of Mantova. Well, everybody was completely fond of her because she was so cultivated, uh, so intelligent, etc. Uh, she affirms immediately herself uh, like a prominent figure in the national and international landscape. You know that Isabella d'Este is considered the most extraordinary Italian woman for culture, elegance, most of all for political ability. If you go to Ferrara and to Mantova, you must absolutely visit the famous studiolo, the small room of Isabella d'Este, which here we have a lot of uh, the part. Uh, Isabella liked very much the mottos, quotes, uh, very enigmatic. Uh, her favorite motto was uh, in Latin is nec spe nec metu, which means fearless and hopeless and up to Isabella was a way of life. So you have to, to try to, to do your life with no hope, with no fear. And you can imagine how, how difficult it was in that period, even for me, for all of us in our century, could be difficult to live our life with no hope and no fear. Isabella d'Este was a political lady, a bit cynical maybe, not very effective, but a genius in political life. She, mm, she's not just a, a polished patron, a great collector, a very cultivated lady. She has a lot of friends in all of Europe, etc. But the most extraordinary thing is that she had a wonderful political capacity, more than his husband, Francesco Gonzaga, which was the real Marquis of Mantova. And I must admit that he was a bit jealous of Isabella's capacities. And so when Francesco was absent, war or travels, etc., etc., Isabella rules the government. And she had a real steady hand. Uh, she wanted to check everything. And uh, she, knows, she knows the Italian situation. And she knows that every, everything was very difficult, very changing, so, so she never takes sides with somebody. Isabella was able to remain in a very balanced position, and so she preserved the family, the Gonzaga dynasty, and even the state, Mantova. Uh, it was not easy because that period was full, we will arrive to the point of rain invasions. And I, I, as I told you, Francesco Gonzaga was not so happy 
because Isabella wanted to decide herself, uh, and sometimes his husband uh, writes terrible letters saying, I am the Marquise of Mantova, and it's me who can decide, but Isabella doesn't care at all. <laughs> Uh, once uh, Francesco Gonzaga was taken prisoner by Venetians uh, and so Isabella, I don't want to say that she was happy, but in any case she, she, she could dispose the situation. And uh, so the poor Francesco was in Venice in prison, very sad, uh, all alone, etc, etc. And Isabella says, okay, if, uh, for example, the Venetians arrived with Francesco, with my husband, saying, open the door or we kill the Marquise, let him kill. <laughs> so it was like this, it was political. That's Machiavelli, that's exactly Machiavelli. Another woman very important that I want to mention today is Lucrezia Borgia. Lucrezia Borgia has suffered a very bad reputation. In Italy, if you say Borgia, I have seen with my last book, uh, uh, I say Borgia, everybody says, oh my god, the Borgia. No, the reality is not so easy, it's subtle, and so we have to understand. Lucrezia, as you know, it is Isabella's sister-in-law, but we will arrive um, to this point. In any case, Lucrezia is the daughter of Pope Alessandro VI Borgia, and Cesare Borgia, the famous Valentino sister, the first part of her life takes place in Rome. She's very close to his father. And uh, I mean, it was a difficult phase because of the Borgia well-known determination and even ferocity. Mm, the bad reputation that surrounds Lucrezia is absolutely false. She is not at all the poisoner that somebody described like Donizetti or Victor Hugo. It is true that the period was difficult and the Borgia family was not exactly, was not exactly known for, I mean, uh, capacity of forgiveness. <laughs> <laughs> but that was the period. And then, uh, uh, third marriage of Lucrezia, the first, the first uh, husband was completely fired from Borgia family because it was not uh, powerful enough. The second was killed by a killer from Borgia family. <laughs> this is a problem of the period. But the third one was Alfonso d'Este. Alfonso d'Este was Isabella d'Este, brother. So, Lucrezia, thanks to the marriage with Alfonso d'Este, Lucrezia becomes the, the Duchess of Ferrara. And in that part of her life, uh, well, she becomes a great patron, important as Isabella, a clever political, and she's an affecting woman too, and an authentic Catholic believer. I must admit that her relation well, with Isabella her sister-in-law are not good at all, were not good at all. Isabella was very jealous of Lucrezia. Maybe because Isabella's husband, well, was very charmed by Lucrezia. And so you can understand why Isabella hated Lucrezia. <coughs> These two ladies are without any doubt the most powerful, but even representing and distinguished of the century. And a proof of that is that many poems and books of the Renaissance are always dedicated to Lucrezia and Isabella. I want to mention another lady, which is Elisabetta di Urbino. I mentioned before speaking about the cortegiano um, of Baldassare e Castiglione. Elisabetta Gonzaga, it is, she is not a political uh, woman like Lucrezia and Isabella, no but she's a very distinguished, very polished and uh, nice lady with a wonderful court. Prob probably Urbino had the most beautiful palace of all Italy in a period like that one, so full of beautiful palaces. And that's why Baldassare Castiglione has dedicated uh, his famous book uh, to Elisabetta. There are some other women, obviously, women, obviously, beautiful and intelligent and powerful, but up to me, these are the most known and most of all, the most remarkable. 
I want to say that these three women, different way obviously, but they really represent the best part of the Renaissance, the best part of the Renaissance, the culture, the political capacity, but even the capacity to take care of the other, up to Isabella d'Este, the capacity of taking care of other of people, it is the main capacity that a real good ruler, ruler of government must have. In fact, in Italian, Isabella in a letter says, la mala contentezza del popolo fa la mala contentezza dei sudditi. If the people is unhappy, the rulers, the government, the signori are un get unhappy because obviously there is a revolt, there is something ag against him. So, after this long explanation, can we assume that everything is wonderful, it's a real golden age, the Renaissance? Not at all. No. Humanism and Renaissance are very contradictory ages, wonderful and tragic at the same time. Our idea of Renaissance is an idealized archetype. It is something very theoretical. But with a closer view, there is not just the grande bellezza, the great beauty. There is something else. On the other hand, we have incessant wars, internal fighting, external invasion. There is a very a strong lack of common project, people misery, disease, plagues, and as I told at the beginning, the victory of particularism, completely lack of a common project. Italy, you must remember this, is very divided, is politically divided into feudal states and regional states, so it is not a nation. You can't compare it with United Kingdom or France or Netherlands. Italy during the Renaissance was not a nation. And it will not be a nation for centuries, unfortunately. So there was not a pyramidal system with a central power. The power was a mesh system. Italy was, is beautiful during the Renaissance, is wealthy, appealing, but it is very vulnerable. vulnerable. It is an easy prey for other countries. Why the, Euro why the European nations are growing and going towards unification, Italy doesn't know any of this aspiration. That's why it is condemned to be invaded and dominated. There are too many cities, regions, lords, laws, army, currencies, habits, everything is different. Everyone who exercises political control is care of his neighbor, so he wants to avoid that he becomes more powerful. Prefer to make an alliance with a foreign king to take the neighbor out of the way. This is typical. This is always Machiavelli. Uh, we have to add another aspect. Lords and courts live among beauty in a very expensive way of life, but people are starving, are exploited. And that's why the cultural and artistic uh, rebirth does not continue into a political and economical renaissance. That's the point. This combination of, uh, combination of factors, this melting pot of contradiction makes any unification or even confederation something impossible. And so, very soon, Italy will enter in economic decadence and will be conquered by other nations. One key date that I want to mention is the year 1492. More or less, we can say that the Renaissance has taken the place of humanism. In the, uh, 1492, Lorenzo de' Medici, the Magnificent, dies uh, prematurely. And he, you know that he was considered the craftsman of the Italian balance. He invented a fair policy in which every single reign had to respect the others and stay within certain limits. So, thanks to him, Italy has known a short period of peace. After his death, the system collapses. 
and start new wars, not just internal, but external too. In the same year, there is the discovery of America. And so, slowly but inexorably, the global scenario will change. The Mediterranean Sea will be not just the most important one, because the Atlantic Ocean becomes, will become the point of reference for trade and commerce. Immediately after this year, the foreign invasion starts viol violently. France, Spain, and the Empire are fighting for the supremacy in Europe, and most of all, they want to take over the rich Italian lands. The Italian, the so-called Italian Wars begin in 1494, and well, they will trouble the peninsula during the entire Renaissance. You must combine these two aspects. That's very important, because we have the Greek beauty on a side, but on the other hand, we have <coughs> always war, disease, misery. That's very important. It's in the same period. It is not true at all that the Renaissance was just a golden age with Michelangelo or Raffaello. There is something more. And so Italy, is true, is a beacon of civilization, but it is a weak and divided country, vulnerable. Being the control of Italy also means having the control of the sea, of the Mediterranean. And so Italy, the peninsula, becomes the battleground between France, Spain, and the empire. Unfortunately, the Italian state and regions are not so strong to, to resist. And so, Italian states and the Pope take side with other or with another, depending on the circumstances. And in, in Italy, we call them Volta Gabbana because they change, but it was not easy to choice forever. Even Isabella d'Este, Balancers once was with the Empire, another with France. It was impossible because Italian states, or towns, and region were really weak and little. So it was impossible, small. It was impossible to fight against France or Spain. Moreover, in 1517, I mentioned before, Martin Luther gives birth to the famous Lutheran schism and build the Lutheran religion, breaking forever the old balance. Christianity is completely split. In 1519, Charles V is elected emperor. He is the king of Spain, Austria, Hungary, Netherlands, and the great part of America. He is uh, the, the king of Milan and south of Italy too. And he wants to throw French out of the peninsula. Uh, he wished to go back to a universal empire, which is impossible. But in any case, uh, and this is the saddest episode of the Renaissance, he will send the terrible army of Lansikenecki, Lanskenek, to invade Rome in 1527. The so-called pillage or sack of Rome is the worst event of the Renaissance, and maybe for certain aspects, concludes the Renaissance. Lutheran soldiers, as I told, are sent by Charles V. Charles is a Catholic one, but he wants to punish Italy, Rome, and the Pope for the support given to France. And so Rome is completely set on fire. There is an horrible pillage. The town is completely destroyed. A lot of victims, a lot of violence, horrible against the church, against everything is destroyed. The, the heretics consider Rome the new Babylonia. And even if, as I said at the beginning, the Church of Rome has a lot of responsibilities, but this episode is something horrible with no justification, obviously, no justification at all. After this disaster, Italy is pauperized and troubled. Finally, in 1559, there will be the treaty, the peace of Cato Cambresi. The real winner is Charles V, Spain. So France gives up on the Italian dream. 
the son of Charles V, Philip II, will rule directly Milan and Naples, Sicily and Sardinia, I'm talking about Italy, obviously, and other regions are indirectly under his wing. We can really affirm that the Treaty of Cateau Cambresi marks the end of the Italian Renaissance. Honestly, we have to underline uh, that a great part of the Italian Renaissance will be exported in the whole Europe, and partially, partially even thanks to the wars and evasion. But for us in Italy, Renaissance remain like in a bubble, a wonderful, extraordinary, unique episode close in himself. The cultural and artistic project has not turned into an integrated political and economical project, and that's why it fails. The other countries, like France or the other I mentioned before, will be able to combine politics and culture, and so they will have minor renaissance inserted in a global project and all together it will, it will give birth to national states. Unfortunately, in Italy, we will wait a very long period for unification, very long. Dante, which we mentioned at the beginning, many centuries ago, was aware of our weaknesses, and so he launched a terrible tirade against the Serva Italia, Servant Italia. Francesco Petrarca said, Italia mia, Italy of mine, it was uh, really something desperate, uh, invoking the old Rome and something that could rebuild uh, a unification. It was impossible. We can only hope today that we have learned from the past and from our mistakes. We must wish for a new, new Renaissance and not just uh, a cultural one, but economical and political as well. Most of all, I wish for all of us and for the, the, all the girls that are here that women will play a role as important as the role of my friend Isabella d'Este, but this time women coming not just from the top, from the highest level of the society, but from any level. I do think that from this we can really see a part of the true evolution of our society. Thank you very much. Right, yes, this is another point. I'm glad you asked me. I want to underline it's such a long uh, exposition, I don't want to make it too long because otherwise you get bored, obviously. But it is true that education was the main goal, main aim for the, that ladies. Isabella d'Este, uh, obviously, know perfectly Latin and Greek, uh, English and French at the, the center, but the classical studies, uh, which are so important for the humanism, was the center of the education for girls, always talking of upper class level, that's for sure. And uh, uh, Isabella, Lucrezia, Elisabetta Durbino, they are all very gifted girls. Uh, study, in fact, Isabella's teacher were astonished. One of them, Tebaldeo, I think, said, nobody can learn as fast like Isabella. Thank you. <laughs> Mrs. Necci, on behalf of Mrs. Gallagher, Mrs. Mingazzini, and all of us here today, I'd like to thank you for nurturing our love of learning. Um, from your inspirational opening remarks 
to your passion, your passion for your subject was contagious. And you most certainly animated and illuminated the time period for us with interesting cultural and contextual insights. Your focus on women was most fitting um, in an institution that is testament, testament to the ability of women in the past and in the present to lead. I believe it was Cicero who said, to be ignorant of the past is to remain a child forever. So thank you on behalf of all of us this afternoon for reminding us of the importance of growing up. that during life you have to avoid bad and sad thinking and feeling because during this fragile life is the expression used by Isabella it's important to divide life into different period because just if you are able to divide your life with priorities more than principle you can have she says in Italian pasti con più laude so flows and uh, satisfaction, that passion. For Isabella, it was most important to be known and reputed uh, that to have, uh, I mean, an effective life. But it's true, it's true the message. We have to understand the importance of uh, time and share our life, uh, have the ability to decide what is important uh, and what is not. And this is up to me the real best part of Isabella d'Este message. <laughs> Thanks. Thank